the Mongol horde, led by the great Genghis Khan, started campaigns that would eventually lead to the largest empire in history by area. In the real timeline, Mongols kickstarted their empire by breaching the Great Wall of China at multiple places and conquering Chinese Xia and Jin dynasties. The city of Zhengdu, today known as Beijing, eventually fell and the Chinese Jin dynasty with it. But what if someone did stop them? Imagine a modern day US Marine Infantry Battalion suddenly taken back in time, appearing in front of the vast Mongol army. Could they withstand the attack and perhaps change history? preventing Genghis Khan from even reaching the Great Wall? Could the Marines stop the 100,000 strong Mongol horde and defeat it? Genghis Khan transformed Mongolian clans into an empire. You can try it for yourself by playing Rise of Kingdoms, which is sponsoring this video. You can get Genghis Khan as one of your commanders and conquer the world. Different terrain types on the map offer a choice of different strategies and you're free to move and attack anyone anywhere on the seamless map. It really is a strategy as the units inflict damage in real time and precise commands on the battlefield can be crucial. Rise of Kingdoms is a free-to-play mobile game, a massive multiplayer real-time strategy. I built up my cities, gained commanders and now I have them lead my armies. All players can raid and conquer and seek ultimate glory in an alliance, spreading the kingdom. Rise of Kingdoms is helping support my channel. By clicking the link below the video, you're helping me too. The code that's also available below will get you a bonus of 200 gems, 2 silver keys and 100,000 food and wood each. Try it out, it's free! Genghis Khan led his horde into the lands of Chinese dynasties. Jin China was attacked in the year 1211 and its then capital Zhengdu, today's Beijing, finally fell in 1215. By conquering these Chinese dynasties, Khan and his successors created an empire that eventually spanned continents, reaching at one point to present-day Polish borders. The size of the Mongol army in the early 13th century is subject to debate. By 1225, the army was up to 180,000 strong, but just a dozen or so years earlier, when our scenario happens, it was smaller. The attack on Jin China is credited with 90 to 120,000 Mongol troops. Some say mere thousands were left in Mongolia. So Binkov will go with around 100,000, marching towards Jin China. But in our fantastical alternate history, the Mongol horde approaching China gets an unexpected visitor. Traveling through time and space, a US Marine Infantry Battalion suddenly appears in Southeast Mongolia, in the Horde's way. No third party will interfere. The Marines appear 15 miles in front of the Horde, knowing where they are and where the Horde is. For simplicity, we will disregard the psychological impact of the fantastical time-traveling event on the Marines and on the Mongols. Perhaps there were other smaller US units going through time. Maybe Mongols captured them. So, just as the US forces know their history and know the basics about the Mongols, the Mongols also know the basics about their opponent. But perhaps Genghis Khan still found the news hard to believe, since he's still obviously going for China. So what does a modern-day Marine Infantry Battalion have? It has three rifle companies, a weapons company and a headquarters or HQ, which is also the service company. Each rifle company, 180 soldiers strong, has its own HQ, three rifle platoons and a weapons platoon. Rifle platoons have basic weapons. The weapons platoon is more diverse. It has a machine gun section with six 7.62mm guns. It also has a mortar section with three 60mm mortars and an assault section. The battalion's weapons company has an HQ, a heavy machine gun platoon, a mortar platoon and an anti-armor platoon. The heavy machine gun platoon usually has 350 cal guns. The mortar platoon has larger 81mm mortars with a total of 8 mortars. The anti-armor platoon uses javelin and tow missiles, totaling some 16 missile launchers. The battalion's HQ also has a communications, service and logistics, scout and medical platoons. Some of those have 60 men each. The HQ and service unit is responsible for feeding, supplying, providing data to and commanding all the units in the battalion. The battalion has nearly 1000 soldiers, with nearly 30% being HQ support troops. Now, those soldiers are light infantry, fighting on foot. Usually when sent on a mission, and not just whisked away through time and space from their position, they operate with further detachments. The weapons unit and the HQ units usually feature several Humvees. 
and if the battalion is a part of a larger expeditionary group, various armored vehicles, trucks and added Humvees are present. But for simplicity's sake, in this video we are interested to learn if pure infantry can withstand the Mongol army. An infantry battalion is generally without vehicles or long-term supplies. When it is part of a larger system, a battalion enjoys the support of additional units. Besides the vehicles, there are also aircraft and artillery. All of which then make up a marine expeditionary unit, a MIU. Those have not been taken through time here. But enough about the marines. What do the Mongols have? As said, the scenario assumes 100,000 soldiers marching towards the marines. The Mongol army had a system of 10 soldiers per unit, 10 units per larger unit and so on, all the way to the Tumen, numbering 10,000 soldiers. Pretty much all Mongol soldiers were horseback riders. Their secondary weapons were short scimitars, axes and such. The primary weapon differed based on their role. 40% of the Mongol army were lancers. Soldiers trained to charge an enemy on their horses, which even had some armor. Their lances were 12 feet long. 60% of the army were archers. They also rode horses, often shooting on horseback, using skirmish tactics. They would engage the enemy from afar and keep their distance. When needed, they would dismount before shooting. The Mongol bow was a pretty advanced weapon for its time. It was a recurved composite bow, meaning that it used the energy that the archer put into it more efficiently, compared to a longbow, for example. Even though the draw weights were smaller than for the longbow, the range achieved was longer, all while keeping the size of the bow fairly compact. Pinkov has to stress that in the real world, the Mongol army might not even attack, but choose to use their superior mobility on horses and simply bypass the marines. But this video will ignore that, and leave such broader scope options for a potential future video. The marines know the Mongols are close. They have some tiny short-range drones at the battalion level, and they're hastily preparing a defensive line. Several Tumens of Mongol riders might first encircle the marines on the steppe, at a safe distance. The Mongols were known to use field armies consisting of several Tumens. Using flags and horns that they did use through history, they could command pretty large formations effectively. When hunting, for example, Tumens were known to hold a single line, tens of miles wide, and have its ends contract over the game, as the whole formation moved forward. So a large army of four Tumens, 40,000 riders and many more horses, encircles the marines and starts testing them, perhaps rushing with very small archer units from all directions. The marines would make good use of their mortars. The 81mm mortars have a decent range of some 6,000 yards. Each of those rounds achieves a 50% chance of wounding a person standing 35 meters away from the detonation. Neutralization through severe injuries or death would require targets being somewhat closer. The 60mm mortars are less lethal and don't have quite the reach. Still, they would contribute to overall terror among the Mongols and the horses. A lot of the Mongol riders and a good deal of horses would have been exposed to gunpowder by that age though. The Mongols have already been skirmishing with the Chinese dynasties and attacking the wall previously for some years. The Chinese were using arrows with gunpowder pouches, fire lances with gunpowder tips and even crude metal body grenades, which would send out shrapnel upon detonation. Marines could and would of course fire from a thousand yards away if needed, with snipers and large machine guns, but each time the Mongols might turn away and accept the casualties until the period when marines would be shooting less and less with those guns as they get low on ammo, and the Mongols would in the following attacks get a bit closer and closer. The marines could fire even their regular assault rifles from say 700 yards away, but they would be mostly just wasting ammo at such distances, probably taking half a dozen rounds or more to hit something, and that something would likely be the horse. As our Marines vs Roman Legion video showed, with 50% accuracy each Marine platoon could hit some 10,000 targets before running out of ammo. At 20% accuracy that would of course drop to 4,000. If half of those would be horses, the Marine platoon would be down to a few thousand enemy troops hit. So given that there are 9 rifle platoons in the battalion, plus counting some of the weapons platoon's equipment that the Marines managed to carry with them, it's plausible the marines would simply lack munitions to neutralize more than another 20,000 or so Mongol troops. At some point, when the Mongols would get better acquainted with the situation, the attack would commence. 
the Mongols might drive part of the unridden horses in front of their soldiers, as sort of a shield and view obstruction. Marines would have to keep together, but not too together as greater density makes them more vulnerable to a shower of arrows. 900 Marines would likely take up two circle lines that are some 150 yards in diameter. That would enable them all to fire at once, maximizing firepower. Bunching the Marines further would both present a better target for the arrows and obstruct the view for some Marines. Shooting at a thousand yards with snipers or perhaps saved up rounds for machine guns would be possible but not very precise. Beyond that, it's likely only mortars would be used. The Mongolian riders would approach the mortar range in a canter, conserving energy. That's some 10 to 15 miles per hour. Several miles would have to be crossed under fire, with possibly over 200 rounds hitting the areas of the Mongol force within a minute. Mongols might cross some 350 yards during that time. More fire would continue, but eventually the marines would run out of mortar rounds, after neutralizing a few thousand horses and perhaps half as many soldiers. At 5,000 yards away from the marine line, the Mongols could keep several yards between each of them if using several horses in a column, spaced apart. Those circles would start getting tighter as Mongols get closer. At some 3,000 yards away, the canter would slowly start developing into a gallop. Galloping horses can cross up to 2 miles before exhausting, doing 30 miles per hour. That's still almost 4 minutes to the marine line. At 1500 yards away, some marine sniper shots might be attempted, and by then the gallop would be in full force. The Mongol columns would have to become longer, as there would be no room to keep them all in just a few concentric circles. 19 machine guns and anti-tank missiles would keep firing, possibly cutting down a horse every second or so. Another thousand or more horses might die within a minute, with many riders. During the last minute, pretty much all of the marines would be firing. 40mm grenade launchers would still be silent as their lack range. But fire at say 700 yards would be very imprecise. Perhaps a dozen rounds might be needed to neutralize a target. Automatic fire would be out of the question for the average marine, if sufficient precision is to be held. At 400 yards, precision would be better, but combat stress would still cause many misses. Meaning less enemies killed per second and every second would be crucial. By 400 yards away, the 800 plus marines that would be shooting might neutralize another 3000 or more horses. A short digression, would marines have some anti-personnel mines? Unlikely, but possibly some at a battalion level, though not hundreds of them, as mine laying is usually left to specialized engineer units, not infantry battalions and to place them in a circle 300 yards from themselves before the battle would likely mean there would be a single line of mines in a circle with a dozen yards between each mine. Not really contributing to the overall firepower in a massive way, as unridden horses might set off most of them and probably cause the rest of the horses to finally scatter off. Also, would so many dead horses present a physical barrier for the Mongols coming after them? To a certain small extent, yes. The casualty figures are big, but the area is even bigger. The biggest casualty density would be between 700 and 200 yards away from the marines. The average number of dead horses in the way would be one per every 300 square yards. While it's not likely many horses would be stumbling one over the another, some of the riders might be slowed down occasionally. 13 seconds later, by 300 yards away, the marines would often be able to aim for riders themselves, if needed. Several rounds would still be needed to achieve a hit. Again, well over a thousand more Mongols would perish. But then, at some 300 or so yards away, volleys of arrows would fly. A new arrow from a rider every several seconds. Out of starting 40,000 troops, some 30,000 might reach that point, if accounting for a few thousand that would flee. With 60% of them being archers, some 18,000 arrows would fly in the air, towards the marines with further waves every several seconds, totaling roughly 150,000 arrows within roughly a minute. Now those are ballistic shots aimed at a general area. The horse would need to be slowed down, and then arrows would be fired when all four legs would be in the air for stability. Today a steady aim could produce a hit within a foot or two from a target at 300 yards. Of course on a fast horse under stress that would be far less, a 10 yard miss distance would not be unrealistic. Still, 150,000 arrows means almost 7 arrows per square meter of the entire circle area, 
probably more arrows per area at the actual marine front line. Many marines would keep getting hit. Even if the arrow just bounces off their helmet or it falls a foot from their face, it would cause a spike in panic. It would basically be constant suppressive fire on all of the marines. And some of those arrows would make contact with unprotected skin. Actually, a good part of each marine, especially ones laying down, would be exposed. An arrow in a leg would cause at least several seconds of pause in firing. An arrow in an arm might neutralize most marines. It's actually likely that more marines than not would experience a direct hit during the first 30 seconds of the arrow barrage. And a quarter or more would hit into a limb or other unprotected part of the body with at least one arrow. The firepower that the marines would put out as they're being peppered with arrows would thus rapidly diminish. After the distance does get to 200 yards, the Mongol archers would likely slow down considerably, with the lancers overtaking them at full gallop. Some marines that would be left shooting would mostly be shooting at the terrifying mass of incoming Mongolian lancers. Visibility would probably be quite poor, with so much dust kicked in the air by so many horses in a small area. Perhaps a few thousand horses might still be hit, with marines firing indiscriminately until the lancers finally reach the marines and plow through them. As often in history, a person on foot, especially one not trained to deal against a cavalry charge, has little chance against a lancer. Within seconds, the marines on the perimeter of the circle would all perish. If they lay down arms, some of the inner circle marines could be taken as prisoners, as Khan would likely order some to be left alive. Capturing people from the future could be a worthy asset. But would such Mongolian attack actually succeed? Or would the casualties cause the horses or even troops to break rank and flee? We're talking about 8 to 9 thousand dead or seriously wounded horses with a rider. On top of a few thousand horses without a rider. That's roughly 20% of combat horses or perhaps 10 to 15% of all horses sent against the marines. Or 9% of the total Mongol force. Those are high numbers, but they are spread over several minutes and a large area. Throughout history there were examples where attacks broke up after 10% of casualties, and examples where a quarter or more attackers had to perish before being broken up. So it's hard to really tell, as psychology is not really exact. But if you believe 20% losses would not break Mongolian ranks, then the marines would lose the battle right away. Though, if needed, a second field army of further 40,000 riders might be sent after some time. And with a lot of mortar rounds and 40mm grenades used up, the marines would not be able to inflict as many casualties in a given time frame. The likelihood of them breaking up the second attack would be very small. In that case, perhaps 12 to 15,000 Mongolian troops might fall down in total. Not all of those would be dead, but even the wounded would be a burden on the Mongol army and a lot of those would be hardened veterans. How much would that influence the rest of the Mongol campaign into China is unknown. For sure it would postpone it, possibly by months or a year. While the marines could not defeat the horde outright, they might make a sizable impact, perhaps even weakening it enough so that the Xia and Jin Chinese dynasties somehow survive. Even a Pyrrhic Mongol victory over the Chinese might be enough to cause a chain of events that would cause the Mongol Empire to fall apart earlier than it did, or simply never reach the Middle East or the European regions. Again, Binkov does realize the two sides would not likely clash head-on. Mobility is the key of most armies and the Mongol mobility would make sure the contact would go in another direction. Also, if the Marines had vehicles and greater mobility, they would be ones to dictate the battles. And of course, this is just one of many settings possible. Different terrain might favor the marines more. Again, the more defendable a position is, the less likely the Mongols would be to attack head-on. But all that is another story that may get told someday. Before you go, check out my Rise of Kingdoms commander leading my army behind enemy's back. I sent my first army force in a head-on assault and now I have them surrounded. Rise of Kingdoms gives you freedom on the battlefield to coordinate your attacks. Playing in an alliance opens up a whole new dimension to the game. In my alliance Heroes del Silencio, I'll have to coordinate attacks between my fellow allies for maximum effect. Collecting commanders is a must and there are loads of them available. Not just Genghis Khan, but Sun Tzu, Joan of Arc, Caesar, Cleopatra and more. Each of them have skills which pertain to their historical backgrounds, and players can further customize their talents. 
the newest update brings loads of interesting content. Register your alliance for the Ark of Osiris, an exciting new Egyptian-themed battleground. Players can raid together and fight bosses. There are also spectator modes where you guess who will be the league champion. Rise of Kingdoms is worth trying out, so click that link below the video and use the bonus code available below to help you kickstart your kingdom. Experience real history by playing Rise of Kingdoms. Join us today! Oh, and before you go, think about subscribing if you like my content. If you want to be notified of my upcoming videos, subscribing is not enough. You also have to click that bell-shaped notification icon. And if you're viewing Binko on a phone, notifications from YouTube also need to be turned on. Well, that's it for now. Salutations! And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.